points for today, Tuesday, Valentine's Day. Uh, General Flynn is gone. Yeah, Michael Flynn gone. Uh, leaving at 11 o'clock last night, the embattled uh, National Security Advisor uh, giving advice no more. We'll see who could be in the, in the wings waiting. Could be David Petraeus could be back. Uh, California, guess what? <clears throat> Donald Trump is your president when you need federal aid. Governor Brown reaching out to the White House, begging for help from the man that he had said he would fight every step of the way. Well, he's not fighting him today, not when he needs cash from Washington. TSA workers helped Puerto Rico-based uh, a Puerto Rican-based smuggling ring get $100 million of cocaine into the country. And Chris Christie is headed to D.C. today. Why? We'll find out. On the program, Ryan Morrow from the Clarion Project to talk about Muslim terrorism and its threat today. Dr. John Lott, Dr. Herb London, and so much more. Stick around. This, my friends, is what we like to call the Steve Gruber Show. This is Common Sense Radio. Straightforward and no excuses. This is the Steve Gruber Show. Call me crazy. What I said was perfectly right and spot on accurate. Boy's got a mouth like a cannon, always shooting it all. Stop, 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 stop. Stop. I mean, you're way off script. Hey, boy. Yeah, you don't stop cynical. It's common sense. Pay attention to me when I'm talking to you. Genuine, accountable, and raw. Here is Steve Gruber. All right. Well, happy Valentine's Day, my friends. Uh, if uh, if that is your thing, don't forget to do something nice for the for the Valentine in your life. Uh, I've got a couple actually, so I'm pretty happy about that. Oh, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you, I had an experience yesterday that was a first. We'll get this out of the way and then we'll get on to the, to the bigger national deals. But I was at my daughter's basketball game and, uh, for the, you know, kids playing, not real old kids playing the first time ever that, uh, she comes screaming down the court as time is running out and. Makes the game-winning shot for the basketball game. I think I about came out of my skin. It was a very cool experience. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, Dad was pretty proud last night, and guess I'm still pretty proud this morning. So there. That's what I did on Monday. Had a nice day. Nice kids. Very proud moment for uh, me and my wife and everybody. Anyhow. Uh, all right. So tough times at the White House. Tough times at the White House. Michael Flynn is out. Michael Flynn abruptly quitting as President Donald Trump's national security advisor late last night. Just a few hours after it emerged that the Justice Department had informed the White House it believed he could be subject to blackmail. The resignation also coming after previous disclosures that Flynn had misled Vice President Mike Pence and other senior officials about his communications with a Russian ambassador to the United States. And Pence repeated the misinformation in television appearances. Unfortunately, because of the fast pace of events, I inadvertently briefed the vice president-elect and others with incomplete information regarding my phone calls with the Russian ambassador. I have sincerely apologized to the president and the vice president. They have accepted my apology. They also apparently accepted his resignation. Flynn's discussions had raised a possible breach of the Logan Act, which goes all the way back to 1799 a law that bars unauthorized citizens from negotiating with foreign governments. However, a senior intelligence official has told NBC News there was no finding that Flynn did anything illegal. But after agonizing for days over the situation, Trump and his top advisors concluded Flynn's position had become unsustainable because they believe he had lied to the president and the vice president. A senior official confirming part of a Washington Post report that Sally Yates, Then the acting attorney general, the one that later was fired by Donald Trump, told the White House last month that Flynn was vulnerable to blackmail. But then Trump fired Yates after she directed Justice Department attorneys not to defend the president's executive order on immigration. 
There was barely concealed glee in some quarters over the departure of Flynn, an outspoken opponent of political correctness who last year wrote on Twitter that fear of Muslims is, in fact, rational. Republican Congressman Bill Flores of Texas said we, he was glad Flynn had gone, adding we need more sanctions on Russia, not fewer. Adam Schiff of California, the ranking Democrat on the House Intel Committee, that was looking into Trump's campaign's alleged contacts with Russia, said Flynn's resignation was all but ordained the day he misled the country about his secret talks with the Russian ambassador. So that'll give the, that'll give the Democrats something to chew on for the next several days. Won't slow the president down in his agenda. It really won't. David Petraeus could be the leading contender for that position, according to some reports coming out of Washington now. David Petraeus, of course, um, the general who's had his own bumps and bruises along the way. Another top possibility, retired Army General Keith Kellogg, who's been a top policy advisor for the Trump campaign, appointed acting national security advisor in the interim. Kellogg, a former commander of the fabled 82nd Airborne, chief operating officer of the Western Coalition in Baghdad after the U.S.-led invasion in 2003. Also under consideration, Navy Vice Admiral Robert Harward, former deputy commander of the U.S. Joint Forces Command, and of course, like I said, former CIA Director David Petraeus. We'll keep an eye on how that all comes together and what it will mean, what will what it'll mean going forward. Meanwhile, in California, uh, the governor there, Jerry Brown, you know, the guy who is, who is doing everything he can to fight Donald Trump. Everything he can. He's doing everything he can to stop the Trump agenda. He's hiring Eric Holder as the, to, to fight the Trump agenda as a former attorney general. He will not be pushed around. He will not cave into Donald Trump's agenda, except, except now he's asking that, <clears throat> well, he's asking that the president step in and send federal help. Because the governor turned to his potential nemesis uh, asking for federal emergency management agency money and to declare a major disaster after the statewide hammering of storms, floods, and mudslides. That dam still in, in deep trouble in Osseville. 200,000 people could be kept away from their homes for weeks, maybe months. The, re the, the request comes as an early test of relations between the Democrats who run the nation's largest state and the Republican administration in Washington. If California's request is rejected, it might be difficult to pin it on a frosty relationship between the governor and the president, said Larry Gerstner, professor emeritus of political science at San Jose State. This comes from the San Jose Mercury News, by the way. It's an easy claim to make, but a hard one to prove. FEMA considers many factors for disaster relief, including the severity of damage and cost. It's very discretionary, and a discretionary call by the president. Gersten added that Trump just might reveal his reasoning behind any decision. This president is fairly transparent with his feelings. Oh, you've noticed that. This president is transparent, says a university professor. Well, that's crazy talk. Yeah, it's 14 after. It's Tuesday, and isn't it great, though? California, guess who your president is? Not my president. He is when he's got the money. Back in a moment on the Steve Gruber Show. Michigan, born and raised with Midwestern values and Michigan common sense. It's your thing. Do what you want to do. I can't tell you who to talk to. All right. It's your thing. Do what you want to do. Chris Christie on his way to uh, D.C. for lunch today with, with the president. Uh, don't know what's on the menu. Probably something, you know. Comfort food. I, I'm just joking. Christie and the president are scheduled to address several topics, including opioid addiction across the country. Opioid, you know, heroin and, and, all the, and all the rest of the things that are going on out there. A huge epidemic, if you're not aware of it, in, in many places in this country. Christie, a strong supporter of Trump during his presidential campaign. After the New Jersey governor ended his own bid for the White House, he had been rumored, as you know, to, been, to be under consideration for attorney general, maybe other positions in the cabinet, but ultimately was passed over for Jeff Sessions. 
The New Jersey governor said last year, late last year, that he turned down several offers to serve in the administration because unless it was a better job than being governor of New Jersey, he wasn't going to do it. Christie previously led Trump's transition team but was ousted from the post and replaced by Vice President Mike Pence shortly after Trump's November victory. Christie said he doesn't expect to be asked to serve in the Trump administration, but who knows? The guys have been friends for a long time. Not too, uh, not too likely he'll be governor of New Jersey again. His latest approval rating is 17%. Which, you know, doesn't seem quite fair, frankly. Been there a two-term governor, though, uh, of a Democratic state as a Republican. You know, that was quite an accomplishment. Uh, Michigan State University having more trouble uh, here closer to home. Big trouble for Michigan State and its athletic department. The Michigan State women's gym... Gymnastics coach Kathy Clegg has been suspended now. I write this afternoon to update you that Coach Clegg was suspended from her coaching duties as of this morning. That note came from MSU athletic Associate Athletic Director Richard Bader in a communication to gymnasts and other on the coaching staff. He said that uh, in the interim, Mike Rowe would step in, but didn't go into details on the suspension, saying the university doesn't talk about such things. Clegus has been there for 27 years as the MSU gymnastics coach for 27 years. The suspension comes on the heels, of course, of the allegations of a civil lawsuit that claims Clegus ignored at least one athlete's concerns about their treatments from sports medicine doctor Larry Nasser. More than 30 women now have filed civil lawsuits against Nasser, claiming he sexually assaulted them. During their times at, at Michigan State, and in, dish, in addition, more than 50 women have filed criminal complaints with police alleging sexual abuse or other misconduct by Nasser over many, many years. One alleged victim identified as Jane B. M. S. U. Doe, Jane B. M. S. U. Doe, claims in a civil legal filing in a U.S. district court, she told Clegus, she was concerned about the treatments Nasser was providing. Clegus explained that she had known Nasser for years and could not imagine him doing anything questionable. Clegus told plaintiff that she must be misunderstanding or reading into what Nasser was doing. The legal filing claims uh, says Clegus did not return request for comment. Th th this, this damage, this damage is spreading. Unfortunately. Clegg is not responding. MSU spokesman Jason Cody did not have much to say on the, on the matter either. Part of these comments coming from an M Live report that I was referencing. But what a huge mess it is for Michigan State University. By the way, Jerry Sandusky, one of his sons, one of his sons now uh, arrested and charged with criminal misconduct, sexual misconduct with a minor. Jerry Sandusky, of course, the most infamous, the most infamous sexual predator in college sports history, I, I would say. Michigan State, unfortunately, has is, is picked up a lot of that headline and a lot of that comment and conversation in recent weeks, and at this pace, doesn't seem that it's going to be going away anytime soon. All right, shifting gears. Prosecutors in Puerto Rico have smashed a ring of current and former U.S. Transportation Security Administration workers, TSA workers, that apparently smuggled 20 tons of cocaine worth more than $100 million to the United States over a decade. A dozen members of the ring, including TSA workers and airport employees, indicted February the 8th in the District of Puerto Rico on charges of conspiracy to possess and intent to distribute cocaine. The U.S. Attorney for the District of Puerto Rico, Rosa Rodriguez Velez made the announcement. Authorities said the federal employees used their positions at TSA baggage screeners to, with may, with uh, they could wave massive amounts of cocaine right through security. What if they were just kind enough to put the heavy, you know, put the heavy sticker on so nobody hurt their back moving it along? Beginning all the way back in 1998, some three years before the formation of the TSA. The suspect allegedly smuggled suitcases containing 15 kilograms each of cocaine through the security system in San Juan, Puerto Rico. As many as five mules or human smugglers were used on each flight with each checking in up 
each checking in up to two suitcases apiece. The suspect sent 20 tons of cocaine into the U.S. Uh, on that operation, 20 tons over about 18 years, well over $100 million. You know, $6, 7000000 million a year worth of cocaine coming in. Well, you can't spend your money in prison, so that's not going to work out too well for you now, is it? But what a racket. At some point, don't you think that you'd say it, enough is enough? I, I made my money time to go home. Uh, enough and well, it depends on how much they got to keep, I suppose. Uh, people do the craziest things, won't they? Anyhow, coming up after the break, Ryan Morrow is going to be here. Ryan Morrow from the Clarion Project to talk about the state of terrorism today, what we're up against, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, should it be a terrorist organization, and a whole lot more. Ryan Morrow, one of the leading experts on extremism in the Muslim community, in the world. A long conversation with him for the next half hour right here on the Steve Gruber Show. Getting your day started with news from around the state and around the world. Common Sense Radio. This is the Steve Gruber Show. All right, welcome back to it. It is the Steve Gerber Show. My next guest has been appearing on this program for years now. You see him on a lot of the cable news networks as well, as he um, seems to garner a lot more attention today than he did you know, two or three years ago even. Professor Ryan Morrow is the National Security Analyst for the Clarion Project, which is a nonprofit organization educating the public about the threat of Islamic terrorism and providing a platform for voices of moderation understanding and tolerance within the Muslim community. Uh, Professor, welcome back. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's been great talking to you over the years. It's a critical time when you look at everything going on, whether it's uh, activist courts uh, telling the President of the United States he does not have standing to limit refugees and immigrants from war-torn parts of the world that are uh, predominantly Muslim. Uh, Syrian President uh, Assad says that there is no question that some of the refugees leaving his part of the world and heading to Europe or the United States, as he put it, are definitely terrorists. Uh, what are the, what, what is the state of things when it comes to terrorism today, Professor? Uh, I would say that it's actually improved just because ISIS is receding thanks to U.S. military power and the power of our friends, um, and they've lost some ideologically significant areas that I thought were underreported. Um, but it's going to take a while for you to see the decrease in radicalization um, for the ISIS supporters to say, look, that they were wrong. They don't have Allah's blessing, uh, partially because we don't brag about our successes enough. But let's be realistic. Even if we have a short-term victory over ISIS and we destroy them over the next year, year and a half, which I think is likely, some other group is going to pick up the pieces. Because the reason people join ISIS isn't because they like ISIS per se. That's not the starting point. It's because they believe in the things that ISIS believes in, and they believe that ISIS was the best to act upon them. So there'll just be a replacement that says, we figured out where ISIS went wrong. Now pick up the pieces and join us, and then we'll be back to where we were. Yeah, so it it seems to me, Ryan, that as these things uh, occur... Once one group kind of gets snuffed out, another one tends to bloom in its place. It gets snuffed out. Another one, it's like it's like a suckling tree. You chop off the bush here, and it pops its head up over there, or there, or there. How do you ever get ahead of this curve? Well, what's most frightening about it is not just that it feels like you're running in place. It's the fact that the next manifestation gets stronger. ISIS got stronger because Al Qaeda went down. Now, whoever follows ISIS, and it might be Al Qaeda actually is going to be stronger because they'll inherit the expertise of ISIS. So the situation gets worse and worse. But overall, how do you defeat this? Well, organized terrorist groups like ISIS and al-Qaeda, you have to just destroy them militarily, find ways to replace them, uh, do not allow areas in which they operate to become ungovernable. There has to be someone controlling that territory that works with us and stops that from happening. But you also need an ideological offensive. Think about the Cold War, when you had communists marching around the world, including in the United States. You could have said the same thing they're saying today. How do you beat this when there's so many people, and if you beat one communist party, one communist regime, there'll be another? 
Well, ideologies can be defeated. History tells us that. And the way you do that is by overthrowing and destroying the figureheads of the movement, those that they invest trust in. That would be like regimes like in, in Iran, um, Qatar, Turkey, uh, to be honest with you. Um, cutting off their resources, taking an approach that views this less as a non-state actor and says, no, this is the responsibility and creation of a threat by states and holding those states accountable. Let, let me ask you this. Um, I mean, we've been battling, we, the United States, have been battling against extremist Islam since 1803, when President Jefferson sent the Marines to Tripoli to take on the Barbary pirates that were attacking American ships and, and, and stealing and killing our people. So this has been going on for a long time. So it doesn't seem that it goes away. It doesn't seem that we can overthrow ideology. It seems that it, it ebbs and flows like a tide. It comes, it goes, but it never really leaves. Am I wrong? I would say that you have a point, but there's more to the story. I just got back from the Middle East. I was traveling there for a month, and I spent about a week in Iraqi Kurdistan. And there, the Kurds, who are Muslim, when, as soon as these topics came up, they'd be talking about secular democracy, separating mosque and state, reforming Islam, having an alliance with the United States and with Israel. Um, and so we have these situations, Kosovo being another example, actually, uh, Egypt being somewhat another, where these ideologies are defeated, um, but until you defeat them globally, where you have so many examples of it being defeated, then it cannot return. So you, you, you see limited success despite a limited strategy that we have. As for Jefferson's War, which is the name of an excellent book that I recommend about the Barbary that at the very least you can beat them back so you don't have to worry about them for a while. And the way that the United States did it back then was military responses that uh, weren't like full-blown occupations, but the, there were times where we went into their lands and we punished those that were attacking us. Uh, we did not appease them. And we also allied, particularly in, in modern-day Libya is what we would call it uh, now, uh, with actors on the ground that wanted to work with us against the Islamic Barbary pirates. So no what you're seeing today Indian, was so, actually tried in the past and worked. Right, but we don't seem to have the, the, the will, the intestinal fortitude to do what needs to be done, which is exactly what you said, which is we don't need to go set up camp. See, the problem with the American military is when we go somewhere, we never leave. <laughs> we're, we're there permanently, it seems like. I mean, we've been standing on the on the 45th parallel in Korea since 1953. Why? You see, this is my problem. We should go in, as you say, um, go after those elements that are attacking us, whatever those elements may be, uh, find some colleagues and some allies on the ground, and leave. Why do we have to set up a permanent camp? It seems that we've come to accept this notion that this is a generations-long struggle, and therefore true victory, where you actually defeat the enemy, is impossible or too costly, and so you don't go for it. And so the measure of success in recent decades has been, well, have we mitigated the threat? Have we pushed them back? Have we gotten to a level where we are satisfied for now, and then the next generation can continue the fight if necessary? And I hate that way of thinking. I really do. Um, during the Barbary Wars, we did things like when one of our ships was captured, we basically sent in commandos, snuck in, burned it, and it blew up in the harbor. And it, was, and it was a big victory for us. Can you imagine us doing that type of thing today? Probably not. Um, and th we went in and actually overthrew the enemy rather than just trying to convince them to knock it off for a while. So Actually, I, I, I don't have to think that far back to remember Ronald Reagan flying strikes into Libya, I believe, in 1986. You know, so do these things happen? Of course they do. Ronald Reagan did it when he was commander-in-chief. He went in and dropped a few 500-pound, you know, bombs on places to say, listen, knock it off. Yeah, it, w it wasn't quite like the harbor, the story of the ship getting blown up in the harbor that they captured. I mean, that's just like an awesome but story. But you see but my yeah, point. Reagan did strike, but did he have a strategy to get rid of Gaddafi back then, who was one of the largest sponsors of terrorism at that moment? Uh, no, he, he he bombed them and, and he made him knock it off for a while, but it, then the threat still sticks around. I want a strategy that just that says our children deserve better. And Afghanistan's a good example of that, where you had the general that just came out and said, "Hey, we were succeeding for a while, but now we're at a stalemate because we don't have a policy that holds Pakistan accountable for supporting the Taliban and other terrorists, and I need a few thousand more 
boots on the ground to help train the Afghan security forces and get momentum going again. He should never have to publicly make that request. If he needs an X amount of soldiers, he should have a reserve there in case things go wrong. That is a strategy. That's reflective of a strategy that says. So we need a real strategy. I, I don't disagree do with that. To have progress. Covering Michigan and the world from his bunker below the bridge. Here is Steve Gruber. We're with Ryan Morrow, Professor Ryan Morrow, the National Security Analyst for the Clarion Project, getting in depth about uh, the threat of Islamic terrorism. Now, you just spent a month in the Middle East. Let me just ask you this, because when, when the Iraq War began, it was shocking on 2003. Most people were on board with that. Most people yeah. were, were ready to pursue that. But in hindsight, it's pretty easy to say that it wasn't a well-thought-out uh, policy. Maybe we would have been better off if Saddam Hussein had stayed in power and worked with him in a different capacity because the the end result has not been positive for America, not financially, not in terms of lives lost or people injured. None of it, Ryan. Well, the model was, was poor. I could easily see a scenario where if we left Saddam Hussein in power, things would be much worse than they are today. And Iraq would look more like Syria, um, which is as bad as Iraq is today. It's, it's not Syria. Um, so I could see a scenario where it goes either way. But the Special Operations uh, Command, the, the leader of a general um, downing, at the time recommended a different model. And this is what most Iraqi opposition forces at the time recommended, which is that the safe zones that we had in the north and south of Iraq wouldn't just be no-fly zones. They would become no-ground zones, meaning that the Iraqi military could not come into those areas. They would begin basically a march to democracy at their own pace. We would build up the Iraqi forces in the north and south, and as Saddam acted up, we would take back land, and eventually he would collapse. So the model would look more like... A little bit more like what we did in Afghanistan, or no, I get it. something yeah, I mean, great. The bottom line with Gaddafi, is this. and I think that would have worked much better. Yeah, the bottom line is this, and you well know this: Iraq is gone. It's never coming back. The Kurds are never giving up their territory. Uh, the Syrian and, and the parts on those frontier, Iraq, the way we knew it prior to the war, you can't put Humpty Dumpty back together. My estimation. But do you do you think that's right or wrong? I think it's very unlikely it will be, but I don't think it had to be that way. Then that's my point, and I agree with you on that. Now, let's come back to the United States and look around. At, okay, we've got the refugees coming in. We've got these situations. President Assad saying definitely terrorists coming through on some of these refugees and pointing out that it only took 19 people to kill 3,000 and bring down the World Trade Center. It doesn't take a whole lot of people to do a considerable amount of damage. Uh, what are your concerns for America when you look around, Ryan, as, as far as our threat level? You say it's a little bit better than it has been, but how do you seriously assess it? Well, some of the disturbing trends I'm seeing is that the Egyptian military is having a hard time with ISIS in the Sinai Peninsula. Um, it looks like Donald Trump is going to designate the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist group, which is what he should do. I've been calling for that for years. Uh, but there, there's going to be problems that result from that. It's worth it, but there's going to be problems, and if he mishandles it and he bungles it, then I would rather he not do it at all. Um, well, for it, example, uh, tell us what you mean. What kind of problems would you see foresee as, that could occur that could be avoided? Well, the Muslim Brotherhood has a, a massive international network, some of which may start retaliating against the U.S. military because it's Hamas. Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood are the same thing. And so if we designate them in the U.S., and they consider the U.S. to be a critical, uh, a critical part in their spine for operations, then you could see some level of uh, military operations terrorist operations, I should call them, against us overseas, probably not in America. But you also see a lot of incitement. Uh, you'll see all the Muslim Brother connected operations lying about the U.S. even more than they are now and trying to provoke a major, major backlash. So if this isn't handled delicately with Muslim partners who support doing so, an effective communications and ideological strategy so that you win the narrative, if he isn't t tweeting every night explaining why he's doing that, which would be actually very effective and easy to do, uh, then if we lose that argument, they get designated as a brotherhood, and then we lose the argument, and it appears that that's something we shouldn't have done, 
then that's a major setback, and we are in a worse position than we were before. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm following now, and I think that's a great explanation. That's why we have you here, and that's why we call you the professor, because you explain it so well. Now, Thank you. for people that are listening, Ryan, um, and they want to know more about the Clarion Project, what it is you do, and how you keep people up to speed on the threat levels, whether it's here or overseas, wherever it may be, where can they follow you and, and keep up with all this information? The best place to go to is clarionproject.org. Sign up for our email newsletter or like our Facebook page and set it so that it shows up on your uh, news feed every day. So you'll, and how, and you're on there every day, you know, saying, uh, talking about stuff, right? Myself or one of my colleagues at Clarion Project. Yep, for sure. There you go. All right, Professor Ryan Morrill, it's always an education. We greatly appreciate when you take time to be here and look forward to talking to you sometime soon. All right, thanks so much. There you have it. From the Clarion Project, Professor Ryan Morrow here on the Steve Gruber Show. I mean, you just can't get more detailed information than that. We'll be right back. And we keep him here on the program here. That obviously was recorded yesterday. Uh, We keep him here on the program uh, because of the information he brings to you. Uh, Very important. On a related story, Federal District Judge James Robart, you know who he is, of course, from Seattle, denied a request from the Trump administration to postpone any further proceedings in the court Uh, In his court over President Donald Trump's travel ban, while the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals considers whether to rehear the case before a larger panel of judges. I am not prepared to slow this down, Robart said, ruling from the bench. What this means is that the challenge to the travel ban by the states of Washington and Minnesota will proceed on the merits in front of Robart. I'm not persuaded that a call for in banc review, I think that's how you'd say it, uh, by one judge ought to interfere with moving this case forward, he said. As the government argued for postponement, the judge referenced Trump's tweet reacting to the Ninth Circuit's ruling, saying he would see you in court. I'm a little surprised since the president said he wanted to see you in court, Robart said later, adding, are you confident that's the argument you want to make? You see, it's all about activism. Can you can you imagine that this this judge sitting from the bench is mocking the president? But that's exactly what's going on. Uh, it's, it's unprecedented as far as activist judges in America in many respects, I would say. Expect to see a lot more of it. You know, Hillary Clinton tweeted out 3-0 uh, um, after the um, decision was made. Of course, Kellyanne Conway responded with, yep, 3 nothing." Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, 3 nothing." Uh, ouch. Now I remember why that hurt so much. It is it is Tuesday here in the program, 51 after. If you'd like to join the conversation, 888-900-9966. This hour of the program brought to you by DTE Energy, providing safe, reliable, natural gas to businesses across Michigan. DTE Energy, know your own power. This is Common Sense Radio. Straightforward and no excuses. This is the Steve Gruber Show. Call me crazy. What I said was perfectly right and spot on accurate. Boy's got a mouth like a cannon, always shooting it off. Stop, 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 stop. 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 I mean, you're way off, Skip. Hey, boy. Yeah, you know, it's not cynical, it's common sense. Pay attention to me when I'm talking to you. Genuine, accountable, and raw. Here is Steve Gruber. It's six after on this Tuesday. Uh, Sure glad you're listening with us today. Uh, The phone number, if you'd like to get involved, 888-900-9966, 888-900-9966. Um, General Michael Flynn at the 11th hour, the national security advisor to Donald Trump, the president resigned late last night at about 11 o'clock last night, actually the 11th hour at 11 o'clock, uh, a lot of allegations swirling that he had not been honest and forthcoming with vice president, Mike Pence and the president himself upon, uh, concerning conversations he had been having with, uh, with Russian counterparts during the transition period. Flynn apologized in letters that he had not been completely uh, forthcoming because of the rush of the transition. Whatever happened, Michael Flynn, who had been a longtime supporter of the president, very close, and as you know, Donald Trump is very much driven by loyalty, uh, took the resignation anyway, uh, an interim 
National Security Advisor, now in place, General Kellogg, former commander of the 82nd Airborne, is the interim National Security Advisor. Could be made permanent here shortly as well. But uh, not enough for the Democrats. After uh, the three weeks of Donald Trump in office, Congressman John Conyers of Michigan and Elijah Cummings of Maryland, two of the most uh, partisan liberal Democrats and ranking members of the Judiciary and Oversight Committees, are now calling for classified briefings before Congress regarding former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. We were shocked and dismayed to learn this evening of reports that three weeks ago, U.S. law enforcement officials warned the White House that General Flynn had provided false information to the public about his communications with the Russian government, but that the Trump administration apparently did nothing about it, both said in a statement. The reality is General Flynn was unfit to be National Security Advisor and should have been dismissed three weeks ago, and it goes on in that vein, as you can imagine. They're trying to make political hay out of it. Flynn, like I said, blamed his resignation on the fast pace of events that led him to inadvertently give Vice President Mike Pence and others incomplete information about his phone conversations with Russia's ambassador to the U.S., Sergei Kislyak. The Vice President had defended Flynn's contacts with Russia when it became clear the National Security Advisor had not been fully forthcoming. Serious questions were raised about his ability to keep his job, and in the end, he did not. So a brief stay as National Security Advisor, three weeks, and he is um, out. And he's, he, interestingly enough, Flynn was one of the guys who was on the campaign trail endlessly for Trump long before he had even secured the nomination, long before he became President of the United States. So we, um, we will keep an eye on, on, on how that all plays out. Hillary Clinton weighing in uh, to Twitter uh, about the Flynn resignation. Clinton posting a link to a tweet from longtime confidant Philip Raines, who made a reference to Flynn and his son, who had propagated a conspiracy theory that connected Clinton and her campaign chief to the, to the Washington, D.C. shop Comet Ping Pong during the presidential election. Philippe's got his own way of saying things, but he has a point about the real consequences of fake news, Clinton tweeted. Dear Mike Flynn and Mike Flynn Jr., what goes around comets around, Reigns tweeted, along with a link to a job opening at Domino's Pizza. So Hillary Clinton's still out there. Make no mistake, she's gone nowhere. She's still out there making a bit of mischief. And so it is. And so it is. In uh, in business news, this is a a real revelation. Apple was plus uh, 0.89% yesterday. Observers buzzing about the last couple of days as the iPhone maker's market capitalization reached and then surpassed $700 billion. Well, on, well, on uh, Tuesday, earlier today, Carl Icahn waved the figurative pom poms to argue why market is why the market is still giving the stock a bad rap. And Apple, he says, he is worth more than one trillion dollars. In a public letter addressed to his Twitter followers, which by the way was up point and a half, Icahn bemoaned the fact that Apple, even after selling nearly seventy five million iPhones in its holiday quarter still fetches a multiple smaller than that of the S&P 500. If the S&P goes for 17 times expected 2015 earnings, why Apple goes for less than 15 is hard to explain. Icon and his son Brett and colleague David Schechter think the company should earn $9.70 per share in fiscal 2015, widely above the consensus, putting it at $1 trillion in actual worth. Can you imagine? $1 trillion. Trillion, it's, it's the, the company continues to grow. And, um, and what I find a, a spectacular about all that is that uh, all of our social justice warrior friends continue to, you know, uh, tweet and text and email and Facebook about the evils of capitalism using devices made by the largest company in the world by far. Uh, if you didn't notice, um, Pierre Trudeau's son, Justin Trudeau, the new prime minister of Canada, was in town in D.C. yesterday. Donald Trump welcomed him. And then they had a conversation about um, immigration. 
and the problems that both countries face. Of course, Justin Trudeau welcoming those from the seven countries in the Middle East while Donald Trump is trying to put his travel ban back in place. Uh, they have differing, differing opinions on that for sure. It's clip nine. I'd like to share just a bit of that with you. Clip nine, uh, Donald Trump and Pierre, uh, excuse me, Justin Trudeau in D.C. talking about immigration. We should coordinate closely and we will coordinate closely to protect jobs in our hemisphere and keep wealth on our continent and to keep everyone safe. One of the things we, we spoke about uh, uh, was the fact that uh, security and immigration need to work very well together. And certainly Canada uh, has emphasized uh, security as we look uh, towards improving our immigration system and, and remaining uh, true to the values that we have. And we had a very strong and, and uh, fruitful discussion on exactly that. There's uh, plenty that we can draw on each other from uh, in terms of how we move forward with a, a very similar goal which is uh, to create free, open societies uh, that keep our citizens safe. So I'd like to know, are you confident the northern border is secure? You can never be totally confident, but uh, through the incredible efforts already, I see it happening. And there you have it, those two meeting on Capitol Hill. Uh, Justin Trudeau and Donald Trump in Washington yesterday. Uh, another scandal continues to be roll along. Robert Kraft, the owner of the New England Patriots, said that they will find Tom Brady's jersey. You know, his his game jersey disappeared after the Super Bowl a week ago. Still missing. Has not been located. How is that possible? Crazy, isn't it? It's 14 after. You're listening to the Steve Gerber Show. The Steve Gruber Show. American Values with Midwestern Common Sense. Uh, the the arguments continue over you know who who votes legally in this country and who does not. Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach continues his campaign to say Donald Trump's right about the number of people that vote illegally in this country. He says three and a half million people are, vo- are registered in more than one state. Uh, three and a half million illegals uh, likely voted in the last election. Plus, you look at um, what's going on with. Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe giving voting rights to 200,000 in his state. Maryland giving voting rights to 40,000 convicted felons in that state. And Dr. John Lott says there's ample evidence that at least the criminal uh, element tends to vote to the left. Dr. John Lott, president of the Crime Prevention Research Center, back with us. Doctor, welcome to the program. Great to talk to you again. So what is this evidence of felons uh, voting uh, most commonly for Democrats? Well, there have been several academic studies. I suppose um, I've relied most on surveys that have been done of uh, of felons um, in Washington State and Minnesota and a couple other places. Uh, they've gone and, and surveyed felons to see how they vote, and they basically vote 100% for Democrats. Now, why is that? Uh, I don't know. I suppose one can <laughs> speculate why that's the case, but I... I assume, you know, it's not too surprising result given how strongly Democrats have been pushing uh, for giving felons the right to vote. Um, you know, it's, I can understand for some crimes why one would do that, but if somebody's committed multiple rapes or committed uh, other types of heinous crimes multiple times, it's not really obvious to me why you want those people making policy decisions on things like uh, policing policies or uh, or how we're going to be treating different types of social problems that exist. Those individuals, to some extent, have indicated that they really don't value other people very much. Well, it seems to me that uh, the, the left wants to find votes wherever they can. I can assure you of this, Dr., yeah, if those coming over the southern border and voting illegally, like the Secretary of State of Kansas says he believes they are, and Donald Trump says he believes they are, uh, if they are voting for Republicans, that 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 wall would have been built years ago. Just a guess. Right. Well, I mean, I think you see lots of things like that. I've been an academic, you know, most of my life, and one of the things that I've often seen is uh, affirmative action on university campuses. Uh, 
you'll have, uh, let's say, a black professor that you'd like to hire someplace, but he's, his views maybe are moderate. And, um, and you'll have uh, black professors that are already at the university go and say, well, the person's not a true black, so he can't count towards being a black hire on the faculty. Um, so if you're not liberal enough, uh, then then you're disqualified for all the other reasons that may be attractive for their uh, goals of diversity, is what you're saying. Right. Well, I think the, the goals of diversity are really just proxies for whether somebody's likely to have a liberal view or not. And right. when they don't have a liberal view, then they don't count. I mean, it's the same thing you may have heard multiple times where Clarence Thomas has been said not to count as a true black because of his views. Well, he wasn't included in the National, you know, African American uh, Museum that was just um, opened in D.C. Somehow, he he was forgotten. Right, and you know there are other proxies that are there too. Um, I uh, I've been involved in uh, uh, admissions at uh, Wharton uh, when I was there, and I've seen what's happened at other places like Yale, and uh, you have other things that will be involved if somebody's a an Eagle Scout, uh, my impression is is that uh, that's held against them because it's viewed as uh, as a sign that they're probably conservative in terms of their views. So being an Eagle Scout is um, something held against people. Now, that's, to me, that's just shocking. Well, you know, you go and you look at a lot of the uh, um, Ivy League schools and you'll find you know, 75, 80% or so of the students are liberals. You know, that's not by accident. That's mm. because they go and they try to look for proxies, you know, to try to measure whether somebody's likely to be, you know, their political views. And, you know, the, I think the goal is in part not only to have virtually all their professors be liberals, but to have a large percentage of the student body be liberal so that there's a lot of social pressure on the few conservatives that are there at the university to change their views over time. What happened to the environment of having a vigorous conversation and, and debate and uh, the free exchange of ideas back and forth? Isn't that what universities and colleges are supposed to be about? Well, that's, that's what I thought originally when I was in graduate school, but mm -hmm. I quickly learned that uh, people like to have others who think like they do. The problem with most of the academics is that they're in this little bubble and they think that everybody thinks the same way that they do, so they don't even, I think, realize sometimes how biased they well, are. Well, it's one thing to, to hang out with people you like and have similar views, and that's what you want to do and, you know, watch a football game or whatever. Right. It's something entirely different to block out and, and eliminate uh, any other voices, any other opinions, any other points of view from the conversation altogether while you're at work in a professional fa fashion. That's, that's entirely different. Right. Well, um, I always valued having people that disagree with me at universities. Uh, in fact, I, I like to have most people that disagree with me because the point is, is that when you do a paper, you want to find out what the problems are before you publish it. And, uh, you know, I, one of the things that you learn to do over time is to be your own worst critic, to go through, find out what might be weaknesses in your paper and try to address those things. Um, but, you know, it doesn't hurt to have other set of eyes that maybe would be critical, and usually people who may feel strongly in other directions can go and point out weaknesses for you, and you can address them before you publish. The That's paper. exactly right. If you find the weaknesses in your argument because you're having a vigorous discussion with somebody else, it makes your it hones your argument, I suppose. Doctor, greatly uh, appreciate your time. Uh, real quickly, your last thought. Sure. Well, I mean, it may change your mind too sometimes, but uh, but that's the only way you can learn. Uh, if you don't get challenged, uh, you're not going to advance science very much. Dr. John Lodge, you can find out more at crimeresearch.org. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Keeping you in touch with Michigan and the world. All right. Um, Tuesday, just following some of the breaking news here with Michael Flynn, General Keith Kellogg taking over. But first, uh, quickly to the hotline. Tom, standing by in Grand Rapids with some thoughts. Tom, what's on your mind? Yeah, good morning, Steve. Uh, the defenders of President Trump's executive order 
might uh, need to discuss the truth that Islam is at war with us. It's an ideology and oppressive uh, law code committed to overthrowing our Western law code, religions, and freedoms. Terrorists have not hijacked the peaceful religion of Islam. They're following the words and example of Muhammad, its founder. I mean, uh, whether we like it or not, this is about Islam. And, and you uh, believe they're at oh. war with us, Tom. i got to leave it right there so I can get to my next guest, but I greatly appreciate the conversation and the input. Um, and, I, and I can't say that that's inaccurate based on going all the way back to the Barbary Pirates and the Barbary Coast and President Thomas Jefferson way back then. My next guest, Dr. Herb London here, President of the London Center for Policy Research. Doctor, welcome back to the program. Well, pleasure to be with you as always. Uh, big changes overnight uh, as Michael Flynn resigns embattled. Uh, I think he was targeted by the intelligence community, by the Democrats, by the media. Michael Flynn under uh, gross tonnage forced out. General Keith Kellogg coming in as the interim national security advisor may end up being there on a permanent basis. What do you make of the overnight news? Well, look, I, I find that it's, uh, it's a little disconcerting. I, I'm uh, a great fan of Mike Flynn. He's a personal friend. I've known Mike for a while. I have, hold him in the highest regard. I think he serves this country. He has served the country very effectively. I mean, what transpired in the conversation he had with a Russian diplomat is, uh, I think, somewhat pedophaging. Uh, it, there's no way of knowing what actually transpired, that he didn't reveal all of this to Mike Pence, or at least that's alleged. I also find a little pedophaging. I think what really is at issue here is what you've described. Uh, he did make comments about the CIA. He talked about the ineffectiveness in the intelligence community. I think there were a lot of people who had their knives sharpened and wanted to uh, make sure that Mike was uh, was uh, was forced into some sort of departure. Well, their, their knives were happen. sharp, all right. Hillary Clinton uh, sending out a tweet or two about the departure of Michael Flynn. I'd say the knives were sharp uh, by the media, by the intelligence community, and by the press. Uh, what do you know about General Keith Kellogg, the man coming in to be the interim national security advisor? Well, it's not at all clear whether he will have the job on a permanent basis. He is there on an interim basis. I mean, obviously, there are issues that have to be uh, be addressed by the national security advisor to the president. But um, my feeling is that he's probably a competent fellow. And then a lot of discussion will take place about who Mike Flynn's permanent successor will be. Uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about Harwood, who's a very, very good guy. Uh, I think that there's no doubt there are always tensions in an administration. There were people who were looking for the first notch they would get in their belt by knocking someone off the uh, the pedestal of the uh, the Trump administration. And Mike Flynn, unfortunately, is that sacrificial lamb. Yeah. And General Keith Kellogg, for anybody who's just joining us, uh, the former head of the 82nd Airborne. So, you know, no stranger to leadership positions and knowing uh, what's going on. Harwood and Petraeus, the two men also in, in the conversation to be the permanent national security advisor. We'll keep an eye on that. Meanwhile, the president, while this is going on, uh, the president in need of a national security advisor because North Korea playing with playing with matches, as is Iran, it looks like to me. North Korea lighting off uh, missiles, Iran lighting off missiles. Yeah, they ought to be very careful, I believe, Doctor. What do you, what do you make of it? Look, I think what the, the Trump administration is being tested at this moment. I think there are a lot of people around the globe who want to see what kind of response you will get from the Trump team. I think that it's critical that you have someone in the national security seat kind of assess the situation, describe what is necessary. The pressure that we put on China has been insufficient. The Chinese obviously can't control what happens in North Korea. They have been reluctant to do so. Keep in mind they provide most of the food and most of the fuel for Korea. If that did not, if that did not occur, there is no North Korea, uh, notwithstanding their extraordinary weapon and weaponry that they've been able to develop over the last, uh, last couple of decades. So I think that what, what the United States has to do is to apply pressure on China. And there's one wild card. The wild card in this scenario is if the United States were to say, we're going to help the Japanese develop nuclear weapons. That would drive the Chinese crazy. The Chinese cannot accept a situation of that kind. Now, it's obviously a major breakthrough. Would Trump do it? I don't know. But it strikes me that that gives the United States real leverage, leverage they do not possess at the moment. So, you know, let me let me focus on that for a second. I mean, do you believe really that the Japanese couldn't have a nuclear weapon developed in like, you know, a very short period of time because of I me? Mean, One month they could do it easily. I mean, look, it's a constitutional barrier that stands in the way of having a nuclear weapon. It's not the, the, the technology. 
they have the, the refined the, uh, uranium. They, there's no question. It would take a month, maybe less. Yeah, maybe less. Japanese it might take, maybe literally, less. it might take a week. Right, um, exactly. Because exactly. they have so, the materials uh, available. Go on. So, I mean, I, I don't think that, that that is the issue. But it is a constitutional issue, and, of course, there's a generation that has not grown up with Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And so they do not have the same sort of antipathy to nuclear weapons. There are many in Japan who think that a nuclear weapon would serve as a very appropriate deterrent. So, uh, again, you know, there's a nation that's split. If the United States says we're going to help you do this, this is going to put real pressure on the Chinese to, uh, to exercise their control over North Korea. That would be a very, very interesting development. Again, I don't know if the Trump team is willing to go that far, but it would be an interesting breakthrough. Yeah, that, that's for sure. And then, of course, you've got Iran. Uh, with, and, and North Korea, you know, I look at the whole set of circumstances surrounding North Korea, and, and it gives me a headache because I know what Bill Clinton said when he was president, that he was putting together a deal we would never have to concern ourselves with a nuclear North Korea or North Korea being a threat of that nature. And here we are with exactly that. And, and, and there's just too many similarities between North Korea and the deal put together with Iran with former President Barack Obama that also looks like it could come back. Um, and possibly even faster to haunt us. They're similar, I think, in their recklessness. Am I right or wrong about that? Well, I think both of them operated under the same supposition, and that was an appeasement psychology. In the case of Clinton, he said, look, we'll give the North Koreans fuel. They're going to stop development of their nuclear weapons program. Of course, that didn't happen. And the same is true with Iran. We said, we'll lift sanctions, and as a consequence, the Iranians will conduct themselves in a responsible manner. That has not happened. So, again, you know, you cannot engage in appeasement with nations of that kind. They take advantage of it. Appeasement they see as weakness. They do not see the appeasement strategy as a real negotiating device for them. And so the United States, I think, has is, is kind of uh, put itself in a situation where it led with illusions. It led with the idea that the United States and nations like the United States would bring the, 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 the Iranians into the community of nations, and they would act in some sort of responsible fashion. That's not the way the world works. That's not the way the world works. Um, all right, so a, a turbulent time inside the White House, obviously, with a change of the National Security Advisor. Now, um, you said somebody, they had to put a trophy up, and, and Michael Flynn, your friend, uh, the first trophy. But usually, as these things go, that, that little taste of blood uh, they'll be targeting somebody new, they being the, the the left, the Democrats, possibly the media. Who else do you think could possibly be in danger? Could it be a Kellyanne Conway? Uh, could it be, you know, who could it be? i got about 20 seconds. Well, I mean, the person who I think is most likely to be a, a, a attacked would be Steve Bannon. He is uh, he's smart. He's mercurial. He's obviously played a major role in the campaign and is now a key advisor to the president. I think that if he's, anyone can be targeted, it probably will be Steve all right. As, as always, Dr. Herb London, great conversation, great insights, which I terrifically uh, appreciate. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. All the best to you. Take right. care. Bye Dr. Bye. Herb London, president of the London Center for Policy Research. Uh, you can keep up with him. We'll be right back on the Steve Gruber Show. Taking a closer look at the stories that affect you most with a big dose of common sense. after you know if you're so inclined i've got the i'm just gonna go ahead and open the phone lines right now you know what do we what do you make about the change of shuffle at the white house uh michael flynn shoved out the door steve bannon is um dr herb london points out steve bannon could be next on the hit parade because steve bannon is trust me this man is absolutely hated by the left he is hated by the media he is hated by Democrats, is Steve Bannon, former editor of Breitbart. And he has the ear of the president. And many of the, many of the policies that the president rolls out are in line with what Steve Bannon's view of the world is. So Steve Bannon could be next after Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, who was forced out at 11 o'clock last night. He, he resigned, making way for General Keith Kellogg. Keith Kellogg. Very qualified, 72 years old, has run the 82nd Airborne in the United States military. I mean, this guy's first class. 
But Kellyanne Conway, I think, is also in some jeopardy here because of missteps she's made, be it alternative facts or the Bowling Green Massacre or other, or other misstatements that she has made, make it easier for those in the media to focus on these things for 24 hours at a time during the news cycle, focus on Donald Trump's team and try to tear them apart at every turn, try to stop the president and his agenda at every turn. He's not even been on the job three weeks, or excuse me, not been on the job for a month, just over three weeks. And while this is going on, Barack Obama and his organization have 250 offices up and running around the country now, adding staff, adding volunteers, adding to what they hope will be, quote unquote, the resistance movement to Donald Trump. And so some in the Tea Party and elsewhere are saying it's time to fight back. It's time for those on the right, those that voted for Donald Trump, those that believe that there is a forgotten America, an America where we should not be focused on refugees and illegal aliens, but rather on the, the veterans, our veterans, that slept on the street last night. Our citizens that can't get room at a rehab center because there's no beds. There's no chance for them to recover unless they get a chance to get into a rehab bed. There are those Americans that actually believe that Americans that are already here should come first and should be given priority over refugees from another country, regardless of their religion, whatever it may or may not be. There are Americans that actually believe that our resources, if they're going to be spent in the public sector, in the government, ought to focus on people like veterans and the elderly those with mental illness, those that cannot defend themselves, those that actually need help. There are those among us that believe single mothers that are the focus of domestic violence ought to take precedent over a refugee coming here from another nation because that mother needs a place that is safe for her and her children. And if there aren't enough rooms at the shelter, our priorities ought to be with her. Or the drug addict that needs help, that needs a chance to, to survive. Or the veteran that, again, slept on the street last night. What about those folks? 500,000 veterans unemployed today. 50,000 plus homeless. And they believe our resources should be better spent on refugees and open borders. You know, it'd be one thing if, if the open borders came with an inability to get on the welfare rolls, but it is unsustainable to believe in any way that we can have open borders and people coming here that have access to our, to our good nature, to our welfare system, because that system is unsustainable. It will bankrupt itself. The hotline number, 888 Mike standing by in Ann Arbor. Mike, welcome to the program. Good morning, Steve. Uh, maybe to counter the attack on the uh, Trump administration, what the Republicans in Congress need to do is open up the investigation on why Somali uh, uh, immigrants were allowed to go into the most secret parts of our airport, airports last year uh, and led there by the homeland uh, security people. And they were allowed to see the most sensitive parts of our, of our defense against uh, uh, incoming terrorists. This is something that should uh, be concerning Mr. Cummings and Mr. Conyers instead of going after Mr. Flynn. It's time that the Republicans get off their butts and they start going after the real criminals in this country, and that's the former administration of Barack Obama, period. And it's time to push back. Thank you, Mike, for checking in. It's time to push back against this army of agitators, which is what they truly are, many of them. I mean, they've, what, what, they've probably got a trunk full of signs. Pick your sign for your event. But most of the signs are one sign fits all. You just protest the laundry list of, of the left's causes and pull it out and you, and, you, and you riot. Your rent a riot arrives there ready to go. Sam standing by in Grand Rapids. Sam, what's on your mind? Yeah, it's unfortunate about uh, General Flynn, but uh, the Trump administration needs to understand that they're under a microscope by the left, the right, and the will and accomplices in the media. Uh, if you really want to flummox the, the media, they should just, from now on, say no comment in every situation. 
and how it really flummoxed the media. Well, the, the, yeah. Uh, I well, Donald Trump. You know, he always already flummoxes them by going around them directly using Twitter. Uh, and I appreciate you checking in, Sam. He takes his message directly to the American people and to the world without using the filter of a reporter, which drives them crazy. But by the way, newsflash, the first president that did that was Franklin Roosevelt. He used a, used a medium we like to call radio to bypass the press and go directly to the American people with his fireside chats and his other conversations. So presidents using modern media and modern Communications technology to get around the press is nothing new. It's been going on for decades. Anytime you can get your message directed to the people, they appreciate it. It's 52 after. You're listening to The Steve Gruber Show. This is Common Sense Radio. Straightforward and no excuses. This is the Steve Gruber Show. Call me crazy. What I said was perfectly right and spot on accurate. Boy's got a mouth like a cannon, always shooting it off. Stop, 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 stop. 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 I mean, you're way off script. Hey, boy. Yeah, you know, it's not cynical, it's common sense. Pay attention to me when I'm talking to you. Genuine, accountable, and raw. Here is Steve Gruber. All right, it's Tuesday here in the program. Glad to have you along for the ride. Uh, A lot to talk about. If you're just joining us, uh, General Michael Flynn is out as the National Security Advisor at his uh, 11th hour coup at the White House. Uh, Flynn knocked out after uh, revelations that he may have had longer, more in-depth conversation with um, at least one Russian ambassador and uh, says he inadvertently briefed top officials with incomplete information regarding a call to Ambassador Sergei Kislyak. I have sincerely apologized to the president and vice president. They have accepted my apology. He, He, Michael Flynn, wrote this in his resignation letter. Vice President Pence, after being briefed by Flynn, originally said in television interviews that Flynn had not discussed sanctions with the ambassador, although Flynn later admitted the issue may have been raised. Well, that puts the White House in a tough position, obviously, because it gives the appearance that somehow Flynn was less than truthful with the president and the vice president. So Flynn attended attended his resignation about 11 o'clock last night. Now, Donald Trump has named Lieutenant General Joseph Keith Kellogg, Jr. General Kellogg is his acting national security advisor, the former commander of the 82nd Airborne. The White House had earlier said that Trump was evaluating that situation regarding Flynn's conversations with Russia's ambassador to the U.S., deepening uncertainty about Flynn's future, and now we know what has happened there. The question now is, who's next? You see the media and the left and the Democrats Have a little taste of blood now. Have a little taste of blood now. So who are they going to go after next? The the, the popular consensus is Steve Bannon, the former editor of Breitbart. Could be the next target of, of those who want to push back. Now, having said that, there's also a mobilization now on the right from Freedom Works. To have people that supported Donald Trump across, you know, vast, Portions of this nation, including the Midwest, where he, Donald Trump secured his victory to become president in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Minnesota, not far off the mark. Other states could follow, like New Hampshire. But FreedomWorks wants to, wants to mobilize people like you, who may have supported Donald Trump and believe that there is a time to push back. That people on the right need to show up at these The people on the right need to show up at these town hall events when members of Congress are out speaking at other events. Don't just let the left get all the press in front of the cameras. If there's a pushback, it'll change the narrative. That's what FreedomWorks believes. 
FreedomWorks is going to stage an Obamacare repeal rally on Capitol Hill March the 15th with speeches from Ted Cruz and others. From there, activists will descend upon congressional offices to press lawmakers to move quickly on Obamacare. FreedomWorks officials are rallying behind a long-shot replacement bill that was put forth and authored by Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky. Rand Paul, one of the champions of repealing Obamacare altogether. It's being called a day of action. The reason FreedomWorks is waiting until mid-March to ramp up its grassroots engagement is that by then, Republican leaders will have a better idea of which path they are taking on replacement, they hope. So that's about a month from now. To do the things that we want to do, we need to make sure we have something that we're pushing for, said Brandon. I just don't want to be reacting to the left. They have a bunch of people showing up, so we need to have a bunch of people showing up, too. That'll not work out well. We need to show up with a message he says, from Freedom Works. I, I, I agree with that point of view. You need to show up with a message, but you can't let, you can't let the left have all the, all the television time when it comes to protesting and so forth. There needs to be some balance in that coverage, and the way that balance occurs The way that balance occurs is for people on the right to show up and have conversations themselves to push that narrative back. So there you go. In California, the the crisis continues over that dam in Oroville. 200,000 people, 200,000 people out of their homes. And there's no, no time set that they could return. Could be weeks, could be months. Emergency crews continue to work to stabilize the eroded section of the spillway of the United States' largest, tallest dam. And they're doing everything they can to prevent a catastrophic flood. Uh, this is uh, the Army Corps. The Army Corps of Engineers is in there. The system has been there. This particular spillway has been there since the 1960s. It's never been used. But it could be at least 15 days before the agency is even able to put together a plan to make the repairs that are necessary at this point. And that's just another little bit of an example of problems with infrastructure in this country. Oroville only sits 30 or 40 miles north of Sacramento. You see, all of this could, all of this water would go through Yuba City first, which is a city of about 75,000. Then it goes down river to Sacramento. I mean, if this thing fails, if this thing fails, it could be catastrophic, to say the least. So now, guess what? Governor Jerry Brown of California says, by gosh, Donald Trump is my president. You know, he he's my president because I need a, a federal disaster declared here. I, 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 need, I need disaster aid from FEMA. And the United States government, because we got maybe $200 million in, in damage from recent storms already. And so, so, we, so we're so we going to line up behind President Trump. Isn't it amazing how quickly, how quickly they turn when they need the cash? I mean, Jerry Brown here just a week or two ago is, in fact, longer for the last few weeks. Governor Jerry Brown has been saying he will lead the resistance. From California, he hired former Attorney General Eric Holder to be one of his frontline soldiers to push back against the Trump agenda. Except, can you send me a check, Mr. President? I could use some, sure send you some money over here. Whose president is he now? If you're living in California and bumping your gums and talking about how he's not your president, oh, but by the way, the president has to designate federal disaster areas. I'm going to guess the president will do the right thing, but... Be, 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 um, be, understand this. It's a complicated, um, uh, it's a complicated formula. If the federal aid doesn't come, don't just chalk it up to politics because they might not be related, those two items. All right. Straight ahead today, shifting gears a little bit. Jeff Steyer will be here, senior fellow for the National Center. We're going to talk about the environmentalist war on science again. Keep your pencils sharp.
Delivering Michigan common sense with a big dose of truth and honesty. Hey, it's Valentine's Day. Don't forget to do the right thing. Uh, don't, don't, don't forget because I warned you, and I'm not going to be blamed for this, all right? I'm helping you out, pal. All right, I got that off my chest. Jeff Steyer, Senior Fellow at the National Center for Public Policy Research in D.C. is next. Jeff, welcome to the program. Thank you, Steve. Good to be back with you. Jeff, don't forget, it's Valentine's Day. <laughs> all right, there. Um, how about this? I see this screaming headline, and I have to ask you about it. Um, the environmental war on science, the environmentalist war on science, um, because the EPA threw out five years of fracking safety research, which, by the way, supported fracking as being safe and effective uh, to appease the green extremists in this one article. But it's just one of many I could find. Uh, what's going on? Why are they why are they changing the narrative just to, you know, appease these people? Well, it's fascinating. I think this is why, as, as, as soon as this week we look to the possible confirmation of a new head of the EPA in Pruitt, I think we may see a change in, in how the EPA is being managed, at least from the top down. The old way of looking at things over the last eight years has been, if we can't absolutely prove that a technology that is safe, that helps people that lowers the price of energy, lowers the price of all consumer products, that creates jobs. If we can't prove absolutely that that technology has no risks, then we can't use it. That was the old way of doing it. The new way of doing it is saying, well, if we have a study like the one that the Obama administration EPA did that had 900 sources and said that there is no evidence that fracking puts uh, drinking water at risk, in a systemic way, in other words, across the board, then maybe it's safe and we ought to use it and monitor where we're using it. And if there's a problem, we address the problem, as opposed to a hypothetical or old case where there was contamination of the water and then literally throwing out the baby with the bathwater and saying we can't frack anywhere in the country at all, no matter what, because there were some cases. So... The battle that, that we just saw play out over the EPA and fracking uh, was whether, in a scientific report, the draft report said there's no systemic effect from fracking on the water supply. That was about to be published in the waning days of the Obama administration when the environmental extremists inside of EPA changed the conclusion of the report without changing any of the science. And... So, 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 Joe, hold on. You you made a very important distinction you made there, Jeff, which is they didn't change the science. They didn't change the studies. They just went back and ripped out the conclusion and put in a different conclusion uh, to fit their narrative. Not to fit the facts, to fit their narrative. Imagine imagine this, Steve. You've got a picture, and you can't change the picture. But the frame around it makes it look different. So you just change the frame. You change the way you frame it. And everything else is different. And you go on and say, now that's a different picture. That's what they did. They changed the frame. And that changes everything. But it doesn't. And you and I, but you and I both know that. You know, the fact of the matter is fracking has created an American renaissance in energy production that has um, freed this, con- this country in many respects from the shackles of being held hostage by the Middle East and others. And if we continue down this road, uh, we're likely to become a net exporter of energy uh, whether it's uh, CNG or or whatever it may be. The point is that America can be free. And the one thing that I see consistently that has the possibility of getting America back on its feet financially and getting getting uh, that $20 trillion debt uh, reduced or eliminated, the only thing that I see that can do that is energy, unless I'm but missing something. You are missing something, Stephen. It, it, it's, a, it's a problem that free market advocates make all the time. It's an error in thinking that you make that conservatives make all the time, and that's thinking logically. <laughs> and, we'll have none and, of that. Can you imagine? Seriously, hey, it's Valentine's Day. Yeah, love, Val- love, love. You know what I? You know what I'd love on this Valentine's Day? I would love to be able to have uh, a seventy-five-year-old Milton Friedman walk in, look at what's going on, and break it down for us. That's what I'd like. But, Too bad he's not with why, us. Why? Why this is an error in thinking logically? Because you're saying, well. When you weigh the evidence, fracking is a good thing. I, I hear that. 
But the error in thinking is that we ought to be taking energy out of the earth in the first place. And that's what... See, the there it is. Earth. It's the leave it in the ground crowd. Now you've nailed it right on the head. You've yeah, And by the way, speaking of the whole leave it in the ground crowd, we don't want anything to do with energy. Have you seen this mess <clears throat> out of the Dakota Access Pipeline at the, um, the camps, the resistance camps that they had, and the piles and piles of uh, literally tons, hundreds of tons of garbage left behind by these people that allegedly are in love with the earth? Good Lord. It, it's an embarrassment to the green movement everywhere. Uh, literally, dump truck after dump truck after dump truck, uh, taking the garbage from, away from the, the Dakota well, Access Pipeline there, protesters. Right? I imagine yeah. they all walked there, so carrying all their garbage out would have been really hard. You know, yeah, they, they walked there in their four-wheel drive trucks and their <laughs> VW microbuses and everything else. The point being is it's disingenuous garbage the way they treat the earth, and, and, and you're right, they're just lying to us, Jeff. So what can we do to fight back? we got a, about a minute to talk about that. Well, I think we ought to um, elevate the scientific debate in this country on a, on a range of issues, whether it's about fracking. You and I have talked about e-cigarettes before. Regardless of the topic, I think we have to try to put the politics aside. I know that's hard to do, especially in today's environment, but to make sure that people understand science so that when policymakers, regardless of their ideology, want to advance sound scientific approaches, they ought to be supported by an educated and informed populace. Uh, that, that's a beautiful thing you said. Go ahead and repeat that. Uh, 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 an informed populace. Wouldn't that be nice? But say that again. I like the way you framed that. I'm not sure if I can put it in but those terms be- again, but I'll try to be as romantic as I can on Valentine's Well, there you Day. go. Is that we ought to make sure that the populace supports politicians who advance science-based policies regardless of ideology. I think if the voters understand basic scientific issues, like on this fracking issue, yes. then it will be harder for extremists on either side to pull the wool over our eyes. I think we ought to make sure that our fellow voters are informed about scientific issues. Well, and they therefore right. make good decisions. Don't pull the wool over our eyes. Or the woolly mammoth killed by global warming long before Republicans were there to blame. Uh, Jeff Steyer, greatly appreciate your time. Have a great Valentine's. You as well. Keeping you in touch with Michigan and the world. Thirty-three after on this Tuesday. Glad to have you along for the conversation. Steve Gruber Show. Check out more at stevegruber.com if you'd like. My next guest, Gilda Z. Jacobs, the president and CEO of the Michigan League for Public Policy. Um, a lot of talk about tax cuts and so forth. And uh, Miss Jacobs here to tell us the real cost of an income tax cut in her estimation. Gilda, welcome to the program. Hi, good morning. All right. So tell me the real cost of an income tax uh, <laughs> well, cut. Well, the, the real cost will be um, the cuts that will go eventually to schools and university, uh, water safety, air safety, our roads, mm-hmm. our public safety. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at a very significant cut. Uh, the proposal that's out right now, um, just the, the first year alone, would cost about $680 million in 2018. That is huge. That is just huge. And what our poll showed, which... Um, um, yeah, I, the, so hold I, on, hold on. Are you refer- I want to know which, which tax cuts and proposals you're referring to okay, specifically. Uh, so, okay, let me, let me back up. So there, is a, there are a couple of proposals that... Um, um, have been introduced in the Senate and the House. Uh, tomorrow, uh, there will be a, a committee hearing on um, the, the House proposal, which ratchets back the state income tax um, over a period of years. Um, so initially, it um, rolls it back to, uh, I believe, 3.9%, and then a little bit every year for the next, like, 40 years. Uh, so I'm taking a look at what's going to happen just in that first year, it, it, we're talking about six hundred and eighty million dollars. Uh, that is not chump change. That is that is huge. So I think people, as they look at this, um, uh, well, well, first of all, our, our polling uh, results show that virtually there is no public support for eliminating. I'm not worried about polling. Okay, I'm, okay, I'm worried so, about good right, policy. So let me tell you about what income taxes mm-hmm. does in our. Um, uh, in our state. And what is, what is our state rate uh, at currently, the rate of income tax? What's the cumulative tax on the average person? And if you take in the 39.6% uh, federal income tax plus the 
uh, state income tax plus uh, other tax. I mean, you're, you're talking about taxing people in, in the mid 40%, some people as much as half of their income. So um, I, I think the important numbers to look at is what... I think that's an important number well, to look I, at. Th- all right. So I, I don't know the answer to that, quite honestly. I'm not sure cumulatively what it is. It's, it's certainly higher. Um, there, is a, there is a higher um, uh, effect, if you will, um, on low-income people. They pay a greater amount of their income in uh, cumulatively for, for uh, sales tax. No, that's tax, not true. All, all actually, actually, most people in lower income brackets have what would be concerned, uh, considered a negative income tax, but go on. Oh, I, w- I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't I would. say that. No, that's fine. I mean, the fact title. of the matter is you have earned uh, income child credit, you have uh, no taxes up to a certain point uh, for all people, and if the federal tax plan goes into place, you'd have no taxes at all on people uh, up to a certain threshold. But uh, go on. So let me explain to your your listeners about our state income tax. First of all, income taxes make up about a third of our total state revenues. It the income taxes provide over one fifth, twenty um, percent of state funds for schools. Seven out of every ten dollars from our general fund is from income taxes. And if you just were to ratchet back um, a reduction, we're at now, which is four point two five to. 4.15% state income tax, we're already cutting, seeing a cut of about $250 million. So, you know, again, the, the proposal that is being talked about in Lansing tomorrow will cost the state about $680 million in fiscal year 2018 um, alone. So that's, you know, that's what's on the table um, right now. And if you were entirely to get rid of the state income tax, as has been proposed both in the House and the Senate, We're talking about pulling $9 billion out of our state budget. So, you know, what we need to look at is we know that we continue to have aging infrastructure in our our state. Mm -hmm. Um, The governor had an infrastructure commission. Um, In a minimum, they were talking about an investment of $4 billion a year that we need to... Uh, to, to address the, the aging infrastructure that we have in our state. Um, so, you know, for, for us to uh, adopt a proposal that takes even more money out of our budget, that means um, uh, infrastructure costs are going to have to come out of our general fund, and how are we going to be able to pay um, for other kinds of things? Uh, you know, we hear parents complaining all the time. About I hear people the complaining high- all the time. I'm not too concerned about people complaining. It seems to be a, a pastime of many. But let's focus on this, Gilda. What's the right number then? You sound like somebody that maybe we should raise taxes on people because we have all of these needs. The fact of the matter is if we have about a $55 billion budget in Michigan, $680 million is, you know, uh, a significant amount of money. But in a $55 billion budget, it doesn't sound outlandish. Plus, you look at states like Florida. Uh, where there is no state income tax at all, so, uh, and so those 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 sorts of states seem to do reasonably well in different areas. Is there is there only one way to do this? I, I'm just trying to figure out what your objective is here. I, I think let's take a look at Kansas. I think Kansas is a perfect example of uh, Kansas. Kansas is a very small state, very yeah, small but population. But whether it's a small state or not, the fact is they have the same kinds of needs that we do, and. Um, so Kansas, back in, in 2012, um, cut, cut uh, uh, their income taxes. And what happened over the next couple of years, um, it was um, uh, uh, a real blow to uh, their job growth and, and um, economic stagnation. So cutting taxes hurt job growth, you see, because I hear well, quite the opposite, but go on. Well, you know, I, I would say that um, we can look at what happened in Kansas, what happened in Mississippi, you know, we we can we can um, uh, go to states that actually have done this and learn from them. You can't compare us to um, actually Mississippi is booming in the Golden Triangle. But go on. Um, well, well, you know, Nissan and Toyota and other investment of tens of billions of dollars. But go on. Um, let's take a look at Texas, which is one of the states that um, some legislators want to uh, emulate. What's the difference between Texas and, um, and, and Michigan? Texas has oil. You know, the oil industry pays multi, multi billions of dollars into, into those economies. So we, you know, and, and we're, I think our most precious resource is water. We don't, we don't tax water. 
probably we never will. No, uh, in fact, we, we allow water companies to pump it out of the ground for next to nothing and make piles of money. The company's called Coca-Cola. You may have heard of them. Um, yeah, and I think that's something that certainly our legislature should take a look at, quite, quite honestly. And we're not allowed to sell the water of the Great Lakes because of the Great Lakes Governor's Pact, so that leaves that off the table. But we do have plenty of energy here if we wanted to pursue fracking and so forth. Would you support that? Um, I would have some problems with, with, with supporting fracking. I'm shocked, Gilda. Really, I am. I, I'm shocked to hear that. Now, hold on a second, because I want to talk to you. Do you have a minute more? Because I have to hit a break here, but I'd like to talk to you more if that's okay. Sure. All right. Uh, we're going to hit a break here. Uh, we're on the line with Gilda Z. Jacob. She is the CEO of the Michigan League for Public Policy, uh, talking about the real cost of an income tax uh, cut here in the state of Michigan. We'll take your calls when that's done at 888-900-9966, 888-900-9966. Glad to have you along uh, for today. From the MAB, be safe. Get your home tested for radon. Uh, radon, the number two cause of lung cancer. Uh, you don't smell it, you don't see it, you don't know it's there, but you can check for it pretty easy. Go to radon at michigan.gov or 800 radon gas. Get a testing kit, get your house checked out, make sure you're safe. Back in just a moment with this conversation on a Tuesday edition of the Steve Gruber Show. Delivering Michigan common sense with a big dose of truth and honesty. It's Tuesday, 45 after on this Tuesday. I'm with Gilda Z. Jacobs, president and CEO of the Michigan League for Public Policy discussing tax policy. And, and, and Gilda, to be fair, people like JFK and Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton all knew if you lowered taxes, it stimulated growth and, and uh, tax Tax coffers filled faster because they got more money when, when taxes were lower than they did when taxes were high. And everybody knows that capital in the hands of private citizens is always used more efficiently than when it's in the hands of the government. So, I mean, it's pretty pretty easy thing to figure out. So why would we want to not lower taxes? I mean, you've talked about the $680 million. Then you went, to, you went from Kansas to Mississippi to Texas. And I said, okay, we've got lots of energy here in Michigan. A lot of it can be extracted more efficiently now because of technology that's created the American energy renaissance. It's called fracking, hydraulic fracturing. Uh, but you're opposed to that. So if, if you're going to cite Texas as a great place with lots of energy and revenue, why would we not want to pursue the same thing in Michigan? I, you know, I think we just have to be sure that the environmental concerns are addressed with fracking. But let's talk a little bit more. You were talking about cutting taxes might mean uh, more or better jobs. If you take a look at what's going on in Michigan for the last 15 to 20 years, um, there's kind of a different story. In, in 2000, our state ranked 16th in per capita income, and we had an uh, unemployment rate below the national average. Everything was great with the auto industry. And then we started cutting taxes. We cut income taxes. We cut business taxes. Fast forward to today, we're, we all are again in an auto industry peak, and yet we've hit a lot of tax cutting, but let's look again at some of the numbers. We're at the bottom 20 of per capita income. We have an unemployment rate that is above the national average, but I, I, it's, it's way and, better. And yeah, hold, it's way better. Still, but but no, hold on, hold on. I yeah. mean, I, I appreciate the history lesson, but the fact of the matter is the year I was born, Michigan was the fifth wealthiest state in America. Now it's in the bottom 10, I believe, and you're right about that. Yeah. But you, but it's not about tax over the course of 55 years. In fact, if you want to look at that. I didn't say that. I said if you take a look at the last 15 to 20 years. I understand that. But this has been a this has been a change that's been going on for 50 years, that we've been plummeting toward the bottom and not staying at the top for a whole variety of reasons, and not just tax policy, although tax policy is one of them. It, but clearly, when you look at John Kennedy or Ronald Reagan or Bill Clinton or people that cut taxes, it creates economic growth. I mean, it's, it's, almost, it's almost irrefutable that economic growth comes from less taxes, less regulation, more business activity, and, frankly, more freedom. You know, again, I think we have to look at the tax policy that's happened over the last several years because we've still had to cut services. We've had to lay off police and firefighters. We've cut teacher pay. And we are poor. Well, we, we, we've we, cut teacher's pay? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Really? Where did that happen? Uh, it happened in Detroit. It happened mm -hmm. in... Um, other communities where there have been no uh, increments at, at all uh, by virtue of teachers having to pay more for various benefits. It's uh, actually coming out of, you know, the, their... Well, their shouldn't, shouldn't, their, their, shouldn't people need to pay for their own benefits? I yeah, do. I, I'm just... Ex you asked me a question, well, and yeah, I'm but explaining I'm saying, to you that did, there's did less money their, in their pocket. On. Did they cut their pay, or did they just ask them to, to contribute to their own retirement more and their well, own in benefits? in Detroit, I know they cut their pay. 
Okay, I know that for, for, for sure. Um, I know other school districts um, had other arrangements so that teachers uh, were part of helping to solve the, the fiscal problems that, the, that their school districts had, and which is good. I think it's great that, uh, that everybody is trying to uh, solve some of those budget uh, crises that we have. So what is your solution then? Um, not, uh, uh, my solution you know, not is we've got a situation uh, now where we've got actually our, our economy is getting better, that you know, we have now um, uh, sort of this one-time extra money that, that's there. We ought to be using um, this extra money to help address some of our infrastructure needs that are, um, uh, are, are, are clear to everybody around the state that, that they need to be addressed. Just because every time you hit extra money doesn't mean we have to go and, and return it back to people. If you take a look at just reducing the state income tax. So every time we have extra money, we shouldn't give it back not, to the people that paid it. Yeah. You have to take a look at what the needs are. Mm-hmm. You have to look at the needs. So if you take a look at reducing the state income tax to 3.9%, which is you know the, one of these proposals that's out there, for somebody who's um, in the lower strata of, of income, so making less than $22,000, they're going to get an extra $16 in their pockets. But if you take a look at, at Michigan's top, top 1%, mm-hmm. they're going to get back $3,700. So, you know, I mean, we have to really look at you know, what, 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 what that $16 is going to mean for, um, for that lower-income worker uh, as opposed to, gee, do we really want parents and, and, uh, and um, college students to be strapped with huge college debt because we're not going to be investing more into higher education in, so in, wait, in our we, state. we spend more on, on education than any country in the world already. I'm sure you realize that, Gilda. But N- Not higher ed. We do. I'm talking about higher education. So we should spend more money on college, more money on, on, on teachers, more money on what else was on the list? Was it firefighters? We're, I'm just trying to make sure that... I, so so you're I'm suggesting there should I'm be no tax cuts. To spend more money, Steve. I'm saying that we have we have needs that need to be met. We have to be, we know, for a lot of um, areas, we don't have any inflationary increases. We've already cut taxes. We've already shrunk. Uh, our tax base is, is, is lower. You talked about how big our, um, uh, our state budget is. Most of that money comes from the federal government. You know that. That doesn't come from... from uh, uh, no, it couldn't possibly because Michigan is currently somewhere between 75 and $150 billion in debt for projects and road projects that were done 20 years ago that still haven't been paid for, among yeah, other absolutely. problems. We've yeah. also made deals with unions to make uh, pension payments and so forth that we cannot even begin to afford in places like Detroit and all over the state, and it's been reckless uh, financial stewardship. And I don't think that, you know, continuing to take more money from the people is the right answer. But you but, and I have a different opinion. We do. And, I'll give and, you the last word. I, I, I'm just saying that if you want to take a look at what happened in the past, um, I think the, the road program that was uh, instituted by, by uh, Governor Angler, we are still paying off the, the, the debt from that. That's right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think you're right. But See, infrastructure projects, there it is, still hung around our neck. Gilda, I have to run. I greatly appreciate the time, and I look forward to talking to you sometime soon. I do, and um, have a great Valentine's okay. Day. you too. Bye-bye. They have Gilda Jacobs here on the program. We'll take a couple of your phone calls right after the break, 888 All right, I knew I'd get your attention out there and just um, have that conversation. I knew you'd be interested in it. Even took her longer just so you could comment. Kim checking in from Perry, Michigan. Kim, welcome to the program. What's on your mind? Good morning, Steve. I disagree with Miss Hunter. I believe that I lived in Florida for eight years, and I believe we need to follow the Trump model, and we need to encourage new business and industry by dropping the corporate tax rate and um, industrial tax rate so we can bring factories in. If we bring manufacturing and corporations in here um, to make things and build things, then we will have uh, more money in the coffers to do the projects we want. If we keep the tax rate so high, then we're not going to encourage anybody to come here to work. That's right. We want private citizens to spend money. Kim, thank you for checking in. Chris, in Heartland, what is, what's on your mind today? Chris, go ahead. Yeah, hi, Steve. This is Chris. I'm calling from Heartland, Michigan. And I just, uh, you're right about a lot of things, but I got to tell you, you're wrong on the teacher issue. 
And uh, and here's why I'll tell you this is uh, yeah, I'm a conservative. I listen to this radio station on my way in uh, to work every day. And uh, my wife's actually a Heartland, uh, high school teacher at Heartland High School. Mm-hmm. And frankly, over the last five years, she's probably given back uh, three to four percent of her direct income. Mm-hmm. Not to mention, the, we used to have gave it back. How gave it, gave it back? Is she was surrendered it out of her paycheck? Absolutely, directly, yes. Mm-hmm. Not to mention Snyder pulling the uh, 3% uh, from a few years ago. That's still in limbo because of the uh, the courts have rolled against him, but he continues to appeal it. So, uh, and, and on top of that, people don't understand the health care issue with teachers. Teachers for many years gave up raises. They have that Cadillac insurance, and then uh, that was pulled as well. So we went from... And trust me, Chris, when, when I say this, understand when I say this. I have a pretty good understanding of teachers. My mother taught school for more than 30 years. I have a real good understanding of how the health insurance worked, how the raises worked, and I can assure you she got paid nowhere near what people get paid today. I appreciate your situation, but um, I, I'm just going to go ahead and say we, we're going to go ahead and respectfully disagree on teachers and have a really good base understanding for it. Uh, for the rest of your calls, you're going to have to wait till tomorrow. I'm sorry. We're jammed up, but until then, keep the faith. I'm Steve Gerber. This is The Steve Gerber Show.